And hello and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and whatever other time zone you happen to be in. Uh, before I start this, there are a couple of, of disclaimers. Uh, this is not a certification course. This is information only. Uh, any of the things that you learn in this course before you uh, use them on anybody else, you need to verify what your Good Samaritan laws um, allow you or do not allow you to do in your particular area. Uh, in terms of applying this to yourself, you know, you're free to do whatever you feel qualified to do uh, in terms of trauma treatment. Um, and uh, one of the things that I will tell you is there are choices that you have to make if you're out in the boonies with friends and you need to treat somebody. Uh, if your choice is let them, let them die or help them, then by all means, help them. Uh, this particular Stop the Bleed uh, course is a, a combination of... Uh, the American College of Surgeons, uh, and there are some additional, uh, excuse me, my dog is, is uh, finding a mailman at the door or somebody. Uh, and you can find additional information at bleedingcontrol.org or stopthebleed.org. Uh, this is also the Committee on Trauma. Another little thing is there are some very, very graphic real life uh, pictures here that uh, show uh, major trauma and massive bleeds. Uh, it's usually about six, uh, slide 16 or 17. I'll try to remember to give you a warning before we start. So here we go. Uh, let's see here. There we go. So again, the American College of Surgeons, Committee on Trauma, the American College of Emergency Physician, uh, Physicians, the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians, and the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care. These are all people who have been involved in putting this Stop the Bleed program together. Again, some of the images shown during this presentation may be disturbing to people. Uh, if, if looking at pictures of rather gruesome um, things bothers you, uh, you're free to turn away. Like I said, I'll try and give you a warning. But I encourage you to actually see the whole thing um, so that um, you, you understand the types of things that you may have to deal with and uh, are prepared. This speaks for itself, folks. The number one cause of preventable death after injury is bleeding. These are some of the places that you will find uh, that you might be called upon uh, other than for us, the range being one of them. But uh, in a, a, an event such as storms, uh, you know, uh, any kind of, of uh, car accident at your home, at your work, uh, at school, these are all places where you may find yourself in a position to put this training to use. So the first thing you want to do is you want to identify and recognize what life-threatening bleeding looks like, and then you want to take the steps to stop the bleeding. And the three things that we will uh, talk about today is pressure, packing, and applying a tourniquet. Again, this goes without saying, your safety is your first priority. Uh, if you're injured, you can't help somebody else. Uh, and you should only help people when it is safe to do so. Do not risk your life in order to help somebody else if you believe that by doing so, you endanger yourself. If the situation should change once you start rendering aid, you need to stop and move away safely. If you can, transport the victim with you. If you can't, Really, folks, your life is number one, so you're going to have to make that choice. And I know it's a hard one, but it is one that you will have to make. Wear gloves if you can. If you do get blood on you, uh, be sure that you clean uh, any part of your body that blood is touched. Um, one of the things that I will say is, is that unless you have an open wound on your skin, unless there's been a compromised skin, um, you don't really have to worry about blood contamination that way. You do want to be careful about your mucus areas, eyes, nose, mouth. Um, those are areas that if, if uh, for some reason blood should happen to find their way there, you really need to make sure that you get checked out and get taken care of. You should also tell the healthcare provider or whoever responds uh, that you did indeed get blood on you and follow their direction. So the ABCs of, of uh, bleeding control is a little different than the ABCs that you would have learned in your, uh, in your basic first aid uh, class. So in this case, what we talk about is, is to alert 911. That's the first thing you need to do. Uh, 
And then you need to ascertain the bleeding. You need to identify what type of bleeding, and then you need to actually apply some form of compression to, to either stop or slow the bleeding. Again, alert 911. Know your location, follow the instructions of the 911 operator, um, and give them as much information as you can about what you're dealing with so that they can make sure they respond to correct and proper people to deal with the emergency. Again, with bleeding, you wanna find the source of bleeding. You wanna look for continuous bleeding, large volume bleeding, or blood, or pooling of blood. Those are indications that you have a major trauma and not just somebody who cut themselves um, you know, in, a, in a minor way. And there may be multiple places where the bleeding is coming from. So you need to identify all the possible places where a person may be bleeding. In terms of uh, certain types of gunshot wounds, uh, entry wounds may not uh, entry wounds may not be an indication of where the exit wound is. So you really need to, in the case of blood uh, of gunshot, you want to try and identify if there is indeed an exit wound, and you want to deal with that uh, in addition to the entry. And clothing may be a problem, so you want to be able to, to uh, move that clothing away and uh, get a clear picture. There are several things you can keep in your trauma kit to do that. In the bleeding, so you have bleeding of the extremities, which are the arms and legs. You have bleeding of the areas of the arm, uh, armpits, groin area, and neck. And then... You have the bleeding of the main trunk, and those are the areas where we're going to talk about how you treat these things um, in, in each of the cases. So again, sorry, I, for, I keep forgetting to make this warning. Uh, this is uh, some of the things that you may indeed uh, run across, and some people ask, what does, uh, what does arterial bleeding look like if you look at... Uh, this picture right here, what you're seeing is an arterial spurt, okay? And here you're seeing a major uh, trauma this, um, to uh, what looks like a lower calf leg, okay? And you're gonna see a lot of, a, a tremendous amount of blood loss. Arm and leg wounds, um, in this case, uh, generally, uh, looking at this picture, you're not going to pack this wound. This is going to be a wound that's going to require a tourniquet. Uh, you can apply direct pressure, but that's only something you're going to do uh, in terms of uh, getting the, the tourniquet in place and, and applying it. So the torso, junctional wounds, neck, shoulder, and groin, these are... Uh, the types of bleeding that are going to be dealt with by direct pressure and wound packing, you cannot, there's no way you can apply a tourniquet to these areas. So this, this is the one place where wound packing and tourniquets are never going to work. You can apply pressure, but wounds that uh, to the chest and abdominal areas uh, are usually very, very deep when you have major bleeding, uh, and it's, um, it's almost impossible to pack the wound. Sometimes in really large open wounds, uh, you may be able to, to probe down and actually find where the, the bleeding is occurring on the major vessel or artery. But again, you, there's nothing you can do other than to uh, seal the wound area as best you can uh, and um, identify and, and get this victim transported right away uh, to a trauma center and in a mass casualty event, if you happen to be in one, uh, you want to be able to uh, identify these patients to the EMS responders. So compress and pressure. You want to apply direct pressure to the wound, and I'm going to demonstrate some wound packing here at the end of this slide. Um, you want to focus on the location of the bleeding, and you, you use just enough gauze or cloth to cover the injury and press to stop the bleeding. Uh, and in wound packing, we'll, we'll talk about how they both work together. And you want to keep pressure on the wound until uh, somebody comes to uh, take care of it. So for large wounds, superficial pressure is not effective. Um, and that's where we come into packing and pressure in addition. So compress packing, 
arms and legs, neck, armpits, and groin, body. Uh, you can use compression on your body. Again, if it's a, if it's a major bleed, it's not going to it's not going to sustain them long enough uh, and, unless you get them immediate uh, help. So arms and legs, again, you can do compression and packing on the neck, armpits, and groin, and the body cavity. So there are several different types of hemostatic dressings. Um, the most common one that you'll find in almost every uh, IFAC is going to be um, – quick clot, sometimes called combat military gauze. Um, this works really well with the standard cascade of, of, of clotting. Um, so the body has this, this kind of natural way that clotting occurs and quick clot is something that works with that cascade. The problem that you may run across um, is if you somebody that is on blood thinners, quick clot is not going to work effectively, in which case you're looking at something like Cellox, uh, or the Cheeto Flex types of, of, uh, of material. And these materials are made of highly refined shellfish. So for those of you who are worried about using something like this with somebody who has a, uh, an allergy to shellfish, um, all the tests that have been done have found that it's so highly refined that there is no uh, anaphylactic reaction or allergic reaction to this type of material. And it is highly effective for people who are on blood thinners. It, it works differently than the natural cascading, uh, clotting cascade that we have in our, in our bodies. So uh, a compress and tourniquet, you want to apply this to two to three inches above the wound. Uh, and when we talk about above, we talk about it as if you're working from your feet up. So as you, you know, you want to move above the wound, which would take you basically closer to your heart. Um, and you want to place, uh, you, you don't want to place it on, on the elbow or the knee. Uh, there's, there's just not, there's nothing there to apply pressure to a, a, an artery or vessel. Uh, you want to tighten the tourniquet until the bleeding stops. And you do not want to remove the tourniquet at all. Uh, you can leave a tourniquet on literally for hours without causing any tissue damage uh, that would require extensive uh, work. You know, there, there may be bruising, there may be some other things, but you're not going to cause tissue deterioration that uh, would result in, in either surgical need or amputation. Uh, and I'll demonstrate, I'll put the tourniquet on my leg when, when I demonstrate it and we'll talk some more while it's on. Uh, but yeah, do not remove the tourniquet until the person is at a hospital and is, and is in the care of, of trauma people. Um, you can apply it to yourself and others, uh, and it can be uh, applied over clothes. And this is a thing that uh, hopefully you all have tourniquets and you're ready to, to demonstrate uh, this as we go to the video. Um, and I get to watch you do this. It's going to hurt. Uh, uh, one of the questions that both Carl and I got a lot uh, at National was, well, you know, um, what do you do if the people don't let you uh, put it on because it hurts? And Carl's answer was really quite simple. Give it about 35 or 40 seconds, they're going to pass out. If, it, if that um, first tourniquet does not work, you want to be ready to apply a second tourniquet. And this is applied above the first, not below. And again, you want to you want to uh, apply enough pressure uh, to stop the bleeding. So these are the different types of um, tourniquets that uh, are out there. Most of us uh, have seen the Soft TT, the Cat. There's the Sam XT, which I have just been playing with, and I'm really starting to like it a lot. Um, there's the RMT, which I find to be kind of like the rats and I'm not a real fan of rats. Sorry, William. Uh, and then there are a couple others, but the most commonly ones uh, used in a trauma kit will be the soft TT wide uh, or the cat. Uh, I think we're at generation seven now. And then uh, the Sam XT, which is really, I think it fits the bill for both. And we'll talk about why that is uh, for self application and for application on uh, another individual. So the components are pretty similar on all of these. Uh, you're going to have the components that there's the windlass rod on the CAT7. It is uh, a, um, 
uh, heavy plastic rod on the uh, soft TT wide. It is a metal rod. Uh, and on the uh, SAM, it is also a metal rod. You have the windlass strap and a windlass clip. So the windlass strap uh, is after you've secured the windlass in the clip, you roll the strap over it. And on that strap, you will write the time that you have applied uh, the tourniquet. And then there's usually a single pass buckle. So again, these are the different types. These are non-pneumatic. For those of you who want to invest in it, uh, pneumatic tourniquets are really expensive, somewhere around the $300 range. Um, I don't see a need for any of us to carry that. And, um, you know, you know, generally these types of things are found in, in EMT uh, and ambulances. So, um, but it is just uh, an idea. These would be the recommended limb tourniquets for pneumatics. And again, they are not cheap. So in terms of bleeding control in children, you can use a standard um, tourniquet on uh, young children uh, that you use for adults. For an infant, uh, you can generally uh, deal with this by applying direct pressure. Um, and this has to do a lot with the fact that um, there's not a whole lot of muscle in the way between uh, the artery and the bone, so you can actually apply enough direct pressure uh, that way. But if you have to use a tourniquet, they make these really kind of cool uh, tourniquets that you find mostly uh, canine units will carry these. They're really like an elastic band, uh, and you just keep wrapping it around really tight, and that will also uh, help. So for deep large wounds, wound packing can be performed on children just like it is with adults. And again, I will demonstrate wound packing shortly. So these are some of the cautions for you. If you, if uh, after you've been relieved by a qualified medical responder, uh, if you have blood on you, make sure you wash your, uh, with water, soap and water and remove all blood, notify medical people that you have been exposed. But remember there's a minimal uh, communicable disease uh, risk to uh, involving tack, uh, intact skin. You really wanna be careful about uh, eyes, nose and mouth. Impaled objects. So I'm gonna demonstrate what, we, what I do and what is recommended to do with uh, impaled objects. And we're gonna talk a little about tension pneumothoraxes and we're gonna talk about improvised uh, tourniquets once we get done with this. Uh, but mostly I'm gonna tell you right now, improvised tourniquets don't work. Yeah, if that's all you've got, it's better than nothing. But the bottom line is, is that they're not very effective. I know, you know, you, you watch television shows and somebody grabs their belt and they cinch their belt down and they twist it with a stick. And yep, that's really nice on TV and in movies, but it's not very effective. Uh, you don't have, uh, again, you can leave a tourniquet on for extremely long time. So you don't have to worry about loss of arm or leg. Pain, yep, lots of it. Uh, and um, if you demonstrate your tourniquet correctly uh, today uh, and, and you happen to do it over skin and not with your clothing in between, you're going to find there are these wonderful little pinch spots. And those pinch spots are going to leave a nice little bruise when you're done. Uh, other than that, we can, I'll do some demonstrations and then we'll go to questions. So I'm going to unshare my screen. All right, and welcome back. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little about some of the other things um, that um, you may find in your kit. I'm gonna show you uh, both the, uh, the quick clot and if I can find my Celex, whatever happened to it. Oh, went overboard. Okay, so uh, for chest wounds, um, there are these wonderful things called hyphen vents. And there is the hyphen vent. Now this comes in a two pack, there's a reason. One goes on the front, one goes on the back. These are vented and they're a one way vent. So when you have a chest cavity wound, one of the things that you worry about is air being gathered in the chest cavity, which creates pressure against the heart, creates pressure against any use, any functional lung. And so you wanna get that air out of there. This is called a tension pneumothorax. And these 
allow that air to actually burp out. And so they're really useful. Um, it, it is a two pack, one on the front, one on the back. This is the standard combat gauze or better known as uh, quick clot. And often people ask me uh, about this. There's four, there's four yards of material in here. And oddly enough, uh, depending on the wound cavity, you may use most of it. And this is the Celex. This is the uh, highly refined shellfish. And this is for what uh, you would use uh, for people who are taking blood thinners. Uh, I have, this is my CAT7. This is my soft TT wide. And this is my newfound favorite. This is the Sam XT. So I'm going to go ahead. First off, do we have any questions before I go any further? There is one question right now. Um, I think you covered Dave's question, and it might be the Dave that's on here about having quick clot and Celex or Celox or however you say that yeah. as a backup just in case. And I think you already answered that one. Yeah, I recommend yeah. you have both. Okay. So, and the other question was, uh, how do you identify tension pneumothorax? So generally, what you're going to find is is that breathing is going to become more difficult uh, because you're you're getting more and more pressure inside the chest cavity. Uh, but here's the thing that I would say is that if you have a through and through chest wound, or even if it's not through and through. Uh, and it looks like it's located close to the lung area, uh, you want to go ahead and apply the hyphen vent. First off, you're not going to be able to do much more than that. You can't really wound pack it uh, because the, you, the chest cavity is just so big and there's so much stuff in between trying to get to where you need to get. Um, you're not going to be able to wound pack. So you're, you're really going to apply the hyphen vent uh, and you're going to apply some pressure. Well, that feeds perfectly into the next question. Uh, how do you use the chest seal if there is, if there is a lot of blood on the skin? Will it stick anyway? Do you have to? Yeah, it's it got off? it's got an adhesive on it. Um, you yeah, you want to you want to it, it's if you're bleeding that much, it's going to be hard to get the blood completely out of the way. But you want to try and clear as much of the area uh, with gauze uh, with sterile gauze uh, so that you can at least get a, an area to to seal. If the wound is really large, you're not going to be able to seal with the hyphen vent anyway. So we're looking more at things like um, puncture wounds. Uh, and bullet wounds uh, in terms of the, the hyphens. Can you if put you that have... in front of the camera again, yeah. the hyphen vent, so you can see roughly how big it is? So the right, this is the hyphen vent. So you're going to see that, and there is an adhesive on the outer edge of this. And in case you're wondering, on the back are the instructions on how to apply it. Excellent. We have a thumbs up from... Ms. Smith there. Great. Uh, I, fortunately, I've never, so I, I, a little background for me, uh, a lot of this stuff when I was first trained as a medic and, and in the military, that stuff didn't exist. You know, uh, what we were told about uh, basically chest wounds and stuff like that was uh, put a piece of plastic over it if you can uh, and, and seal the air uh, from um, going in and, and coming out, uh, things have gotten much better. Uh, the one thing I will, I will say that war does is it really increases our medical technology by leaps and bounds. So, uh, yeah, these are things that, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't have much of. And, uh, in fact, one of the things that I, I will tell you is that when you are, um, out and about and you, and especially if, if you're out in the boonies, um, and you're, and you're with people, please first encourage them to have their own uh, trauma kit or first uh, uh, personal first aid kit, because you really, in cases like that, you want to use theirs first before you use um, some, your own, um, mainly because you never know something may happen to you and then who's going to take care of you if you don't have stuff. So um, any other questions? Uh, not at the moment. Cool. So I think I'm going to go ahead and um, let's do, see if I can find it. Let's do the wound packing first today. And um, 
I will also do um, an impaled uh, piece. So uh, for, for me, because I don't want to spend the more than $300 for a uh, simulated body, because uh, I don't get paid to do this, and um, anything I buy comes generally out of my pocket, is um, I use a pool noodle. So the first thing I'm going to do is glove up. And I really recommend that you keep nitro gloves in your kit, not latex, because people actually, and I'm using a slightly larger pair today because yesterday I realized after I had dislocated my finger the day before that putting on gloves that were really tight was difficult. So I'm gonna go ahead and glove up. And then what you do is, uh, this is some training, uh, this is basically the, the full length of what quick clot would be if you had it in your packet. So you can see there's a lot of material there. And what I do is I take two fingers and I wrap the gauze around it. And then in this case, I'm gonna pack the wound by first sticking those two fingers in there. And then I'm just gonna continue to pack the wound. And I'm gonna keep going until I can't get any more material in that wound. And this is a lot of fun because the inside of this pool noodle is hollow. So <laughs> I can put a lot of material in there. But just for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. What you do with the rest of this material, right, is you're gonna place it over the wound and you're gonna apply pressure. Okay, and the first thing you, before you apply a tourniquet, unless you automatically look at this, uh, the, the, the trauma, and you know that direct pressure is not going to keep the blood from flowing, uh, this is an immediate kind of slow the bleeding down, apply pressure, and then uh, if that doesn't work, you're going to apply a tourniquet. So that's for a gag. Lonnie, can you uh, unmute yourself? I'm sorry, I accidentally clicked on something I shouldn't have. Okay, sorry. My got apologies. Muted. Nope, that's all right. So uh, again, this is a smaller opening. That was a larger one. Uh, again, the two fingers with the, with the gauze on it and go ahead and start packing. And again, you pack until you can't get anything in there. And don't worry about really going in there, okay? First off, they're already in pain if they haven't passed out already. Um, and you're not, gonna, you're not gonna do any more damage. Again, once you're done, direct pressure, right? Just enough pressure to stop the bleeding. If the bleeding won't stop, then you're gonna go ahead and put a tourniquet on. And then the last thing I'm gonna cover before we move to the tourniquet is what happens when we have a through and through with an object. So now we have an impalement. And the question I always get is, what do you do? And this is what you do. You do not take it out. It will not be removed until that person is transported to a center where they can be cared for. But what you wanna do is you want to stabilize that object. So you're gonna take some kind of gauze bandage and you're basically gonna wrap that in such a way, right? That you are holding that object as still and in place as possible, right? And then once you do that, right? That's all you're going to do. Because right now, that object is acting as a stopper. Any, any vessel that it's, that it's pierced, it is actually sealing it. So you're going to have much less bleeding than you would if you pull it out. Once you pull it out, if that thing is hit an artery, now you've got a bigger problem. So that's what you're going to do with a through impalement. Okay? Any questions so far? 
Yeah, there was a question uh, on tourniquet use in practice. Uh, if you practice with your tourniquet, is it going to degrade the tourniquet? Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, I, have, I have multiple tourniquets that I use for training. Uh, and if you want to get one for training, go ahead and buy the cheapy knockoff one from Amazon. Uh, it doesn't really degrade the tourniquet uh, to use it uh, uh, as, you know, to demonstrate on yourself, to, uh, make sure you know how to do it. Um, once the tourniquet's used on a, on a patient, obviously you're not going to reuse it because you're going to have blood uh, on it. Uh, but it generally doesn't hurt them um, to use them. Just don't use, don't do it a lot but it is, it's okay to practice with them. Um, I, uh, the ones that I keep in my trauma kit are still in their, in their sterile uh, packaging. Um, and that's one reason why you may not want to use your own uh, unless you've already taken it out of its package. Hopefully that answers your questions. So this is the SAM XT. And the way this is staged for me is it's already ready to loop around. So I have it already threaded through the buckle. Oftentimes if you go and you look at like a YouTube, they will not have staged it. They'll go through the whole thing of put it through the buckle and everything else. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna apply this staged as it is. I'm gonna apply it to my leg because it's just a lot easier to demonstrate that. Move my camera over and You gonna show us the bruise from yesterday? Uh, yeah, it's not too bad. So a little bit, little bit of pinch, but not too bad. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna get the band uh, that is on the windlass. It's not gonna be on the wound. It's gonna be where the artery is that you're trying to compress. Okay. And the thing that I like about this is once you pull it. there's a little pop and that pop tells me that I've tightened that as much as I can with my own strength. And now I'm going to go ahead and twist the windlass and yes, it does hurt. And you lock it in the windlass strap and generally your indication of whether or not this is done far enough is that uh, the bleeding has stopped. Uh, if you're doing your own demonstration, you might want to reach down and see if you can find the pulse at the base of the foot, and you should not be able to feel a pulse down there at all. So, but if you can see, I don't know if you can get a good picture of that, there's a pretty good pinch right there. And yes, it does hurt. Um, and yes, it is uncomfortable, but I'm going to go ahead and keep this the way it is for right now so that uh, you realize that you can actually kind of function with this. Um, just the way it is. Any questions so far? Nothing so, additional that I've seen. Great. For those of you who, and I'm going to ask Ed to go ahead and unpin my video. And for those of you who have a tourniquet and uh, want to uh, go ahead and demonstrate um, uh, putting a tourniquet on yourself, uh, that would be really good. You want to switch your video to your face so we don't look at your uh, oh, bulging darn. biceps? Anybody? Is anybody going to do it? Come on. Yesterday we had, I think, two. Since I was going to volunteer Paul, but he's not here. Leave him. <laughs> Oh, Paul, I just gave Paul, I just gave Paul 14 hours of video to edit. So, uh, <laughs> he's so busy. The, the thing I want to tell you, for those of you who, who aren't going to demonstrate today, uh, you really need to practice this. Uh, if you've never put a tourniquet on before, um, you need to practice. You need the muscle memory because in a, in a, a trauma event, adrenaline is going to kick in. It's much like when you're in a self-defense situation where your focus becomes extremely narrow and things are a little disoriented. Uh, so you really want to spend the time practicing in the same way that you would practice uh, your defensive shooting 
um, and, and the scenarios that you deal through so that you have it in your brain, so that your brain is there, the muscle memory is there. You want to be able to deal with this uh, without having to spend a lot of time fumbling around. You want to stage your, your tourniquet so that it's ready to be used, that you don't have to mess with it. Uh, you want to have uh, the material that you're going to use for like wound packing, uh, you know, things like that. Um, you know, you want to, you want to be able to do that. So, uh, if you don't have one to demonstrate today, that's fine, but, um, definitely you want to spend some time doing that. And let me, let me volunteer you like I volunteered you yesterday. You know, the, the beauty of the discord server is, uh, if you do then acquire one between now and whenever, um, Lonnie is, uh, always on the discord server uh and uh you guys can hop in a video chat and he can he can do that i suspect it's probably also time to talk uh about staging staging tourniquets either either today or sometime in the future yeah i want to do one other important i know you wanted to do the israeli bandage yeah i'm going to do the israeli bandage so i'm going to change my camera again come on all right. So if you want to go ahead and pin my video again, Ed, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate. All right. So the Israeli bandage uh, is, is really, really nice because it, it actually is an elasticized compression bandage, right? And it has a pressure bar on top. And so the way this is done, again, I'm going to go ahead and move out, is you're going to go ahead and put the Packed area around the wound, right? Centered over the wound. And normally the Israeli bandage, there's a little string that goes through this roll right here. And so you don't have to worry about dropping it. And it allows you a little more use of your hand. But you're going to go ahead and set that up. And you're going to wrap that. And you're going to get that. You're going to put it through this bar. It's going to fold back over itself. And then what you're going to do is you're going to wrap. Okay. And oop, that's the problem when this happens. Sorry about that. Lonnie, I keep clicking the wrong thing. I apologize. Um, there was one question. Is this what you use for head wounds? And again, apologies, you will have to unmute yourself because I'm an idiot. So for head wounds, yeah, you would use something like this for head wounds. You can use it for chest cavity. You can use it for any wound. Uh, and there are some really nice instructional videos on, uh, on YouTube on uh, how to set up the wrap for a head. Uh, it's a little hard to do that uh, as a demonstration. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> As a demonstration on yourself, it just it doesn't work very well. Uh, so anyway, you're going to go ahead and pin my video again. Uh, you're pinned. Ah, interesting. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to wrap this around. And you're going to pull it tight as you go. The nice thing about it is you can actually wrap this in such a way that it becomes also a shield against uh, uh, infectious uh, material. And the other thing that's really nice about the Israeli bandage is that you can kind of use it as an emergency tourniquet. You slide this bar under and you hook it on and then you can twist it and keep twisting it and right over the pressure bar and you can get more pressure that way and then once you've got enough pressure you just hook that bar underneath come on and it sits there and holds just like that. And you can actually, it's not really a tourniquet, but it will provide more pressure than just you might be able to. And it also frees you up to use, uh, to, to deal with any other injury at the same time. You've, 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 uh, you've, you've uh, dealt with 
the the worst part of the wound, uh, so to speak, but there may be other injuries that need your attention, and now you're free to do that because you've got this pressure dressing on there. So that's the Israeli bandage. This one has been rather sorely used. By the way, it is definitely a one-use kind of a thing for lots of reasons, even for demonstration, because it's got these little barbs, and it's uh, it basically tears up the material as you use it. But that's the Israeli bandage. And they make it in several sizes, and they also make it uh, with a double padding uh, for front and back. So again, for exit and entry wounds, uh, you can use it there. It's not a hyphen vent, though, so it's not going to deal with uh, tension pneumothoraxes. So I so. successfully did mute you this time for this question, Lonnie. Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you have a, a link to the kit that you recommend the most for someone that isn't going to put one together themselves? So there, there are two companies that I use. One is called Rescue Essentials. Their pricing is, is better than my medic, which is uh, the people that I bought this, my major trauma pack from. Uh, they have ready-made kits at different levels. Uh, one of the things that I will caution with, uh, I think it's with my medic. They, uh, in all of their, their stop the bleed kits with a tourniquet, they include the rat's tourniquet unless you specifically ask them to put in the cat. Um, it's a little more expensive if, you, if they put in the cat, uh, but I would definitely uh, do that. The rat's tourniquet really is not, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I guess I'm a little um, biased, one might say. And that is, is that I think rats are just that, they're rats. And um, it's, it's, not, it's not a very effective tourniquet for our purposes. So yeah, uh, mymedic.com and Rescue Essentials. And yeah, I, think, the, I think Dan, I think the, uh, the the Danielle was looking for show me a specific link on that site that she can just click buy now. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, let me let me <laughs> Danielle, you're being difficult, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> let me let me see if I can find. Uh, well, and if you can throw it in the channel later too, you don't have to do it while we're all staring at you. Yeah. Uh, Unless you want yeah. to. I, it's six and one half the other. I think we have lots of time. I want to go get lunch. I'm hungry. Oh, Oh, I do have a question from Kat uh, sure. while you're looking for that link. Uh, could you go a little more into tourniquet application one-handed for treating yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. So let me, let me uh, jump back into the video just for a second. So, yeah, the biggest problem that most people have, and I think I'll do that with the – oh, yeah, I'll do it with the cat. Um, the biggest problem that most people have – is um, they pull from the wrong direction. So often when we when we put a tourniquet on, when we put a tourniquet on ourselves, we do it this way. And what you find is, is that it's really hard to get tension. So here's the thing, go the other way, right? You wanna pull underneath, not over the top, right? So what you wanna do, right? is pull from the other side, right? You want to pull under instead of over, right? You get way more tension this way than you do this way. So you want to pull from there, and then what you're going to do is make sure your windlass is, is, is reachable, right? Pull that, set it up and go ahead and twist the windlass, right? Lock the windlass in place. Then you're gonna take this and you're gonna wrap it. You're gonna first take this, which is the little clip that goes over the top. You're gonna write down the time that you applied the tourniquet. And then you're gonna go ahead and wrap this over it so that it um, is out of the way. Hopefully that answers your question, Kat. So yeah, the trick about self-application, especially in the upper limb, is to come from underneath, not over the top. You get way more strength pulling down this way than you do trying to do this. Okay, anything else? 
I don't see anything else in either channels. Cool. Well, I really thank you all for, for playing along with me today. Uh, I do, I'm going to show you, see if I can get this and change my camera again. So this pan right. Okay, so there this you. is my major trauma kit. And like I said, this is set up for a mass casualty event. So I have a lot more stuff than it was originally in this. I've added a lot to it. Uh, the Israeli bandages. Uh, in addition to the Cat 7, there's uh, two more, uh, two more uh, tourniquets that are in here. Uh, there's, there's a uh, saline wash that's in here. Uh, there are um, scissors. And what I have taken out of this, because, again, we are working with uh, Good Samaritan laws, is the suture kit that I usually have in this and the nasal airway. Uh, that I keep, uh, but it's got, it's pretty much set up uh, to handle. It's even got a little CPR mask and uh, one way vent, uh, things like that. So this is, this is the major trauma kit that I take. This goes with me every time I go to the range. Uh, and I have another um, kit that I keep in the car. And then I have a small personal kit for when I'm out just on my own, like mountain biking and stuff like that. Hey, Lonnie. Yeah. Is there a reason that that uh, tourniquet's not staged? It looks like it's still in its shrink wrap. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't done that. You're right. And mainly, I haven't done that because this one is staged. <laughs> <laughs> There's a comment in the Discord chat that uh, is very worthwhile. Most first aid and trauma kits are FSA or HSA eligible. So if you have one of those types of medical accounts, you can use them to purchase purchase uh, first aid kits or trauma kits or even supplies for either. Right. Yeah, just uh, uh, not, not to belabor the, the staging thing. Do you, can, can, um, did we show them how to stage? Cause that was oh. one of the really useful things that we did last year in California was okay. somebody, somebody took my mind out of the package and staged it for me. And now I know how to do it. <laughs> so staging, let's see if I can get my trauma kit out of the way. So staging is basically you are you want to send your loop through, right? You want to have your loop. Uh, go ahead and put your windlass in its little clip. Let's see if I can get a little more. There we go. Uh, get that, and then what you're basically going to do is wrap this over itself, and then if I do this right. and it holds itself in place. So it's all staged. And so then all you do is you just take the tab, pull it loose, and there you are. Okay? Yeah. And that works the same for the, uh, the SAM TT. Uh, the Soft XT is not a Velcro strap. So the only thing you can do is just fold it uh, and keep it in place. From a time position, you could put a a, band, a, a rubber band around it. Mine I actually do, came with a rubber band. It's yeah. Certainly, I'm staring at it, and it's got a rubber band around it. That's how Al staged it. Yeah. So the thing that I want to talk about a little bit about the soft TT wide, and one of the things that makes it difficult to be your only uh, tourniquet is that it is really difficult to self-apply because although it has a nice steel windlass, uh, and, and that's really good, that's uh, one of the advantages of the uh, SAM XT is it also has a metal windlass. Uh, this little last little piece right here that clips and holds the windlass in place besides being in its, in its clip uh, is a real pain in the butt to, to, to actually secure if you have the tourniquet applied correctly and the windlass twisted down correctly. It's really hard because the windlass wants to buckle up like this. It wants to actually point up when it's really tight and getting this over it can be a pain if you're doing it one-handed. 
So this is really, this is a fine tourniquet for applying to somebody else. It's not that good for self-application, which is why I recommend either the CAT or the SAM XT. And that's pretty much it, unless people have a question. Uh, if I were going to recommend there was, you to buy oh, your sorry, first you, tourniquet, uh, I would say, from my experience right now, I would I would definitely say the SAM. Um, and the ratcheting the ratcheting makes it really easy to apply, uh, and it is easy to apply to yourself, and it's easy to apply to a, to another individual. So I would say that the SAM XT is is the one um, that I would probably look at. Uh, I can tell you that Rescue Essentials is about $4 cheaper than my medic for the same tourniquet. Um, so if, if you're looking at your budget, um, yeah, you want to do that. Please do stay away from like the Amazon ones because if you're seeing something that's at an insanely reasonable price, it's because it's cheap and a knockoff and it is not going to do well for you. But if you end up with one, use it for training. Use it as a trainer. Yep. So hopefully, Cam, that answered your question. All right. I think we're good. Lonnie, thank you again. Oh, one last thing. Oh, uh -oh. Taking gloves off. Oh, How yeah. do we take gloves off? Go. Okay. So um, what you want to do when you take your gloves off is you do not want to have skin contact with, the, with anything that was on the outside with any of your skin inside that glove. So you take, you take a part of the glove and you basically pull it down so it's out. Now you're at the inside of the glove. You can go ahead and handle it, put it in the gloved hand, making sure you don't make contact with the outside of the glove with your bare hand. Slip a finger under the glove, pull it down, and now dispose of the glove. And that's how you, that's how you take a glove off. And that's it.